Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Before we start the show, I wanted to let you know that I am opening my calendar for new one-on-one coaching clients this fall. I have room for just three. I help my clients bridge the gap between what they know they need to be doing to take care of themselves and actually doing it. It's highly personalized stuff. We identify where you are now, how you want your life to feel, what your health goals are, what's in the way, and then we map out steps to get there, making really small, doable changes in the direction of better with the compassion and smart strategy that I can offer having done this work for many years. I just got this wonderful gratitude email from a client that I've worked with for just a handful of sessions once a year in 2020 and 2021. And she wrote that the changes that she implemented in her daily life from our work together have endured the test of time and have made a much bigger impact than unsustainable short sprints. So if you are ready to do something different, let me know. Visit BrodyWelch.com, that's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H, and head over to the coaching page or the level up page and read how other clients of mine have stopped living in stress and overwhelm, created time for themselves, dropped weight and outdated self-judgments, and have developed more self-compassion and feel at home in their bodies. You can do this you are worth investing in, and I am here to help. Well, three of you at least. Learn more at brodywelch.com. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of today's episode. Hello, and welcome to today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I am thrilled to be spending time with you. As I continue this season of demystifying various aspects of Chinese medicine and Our past few episodes have been about acupressure and qigong, and today is going to be a kind of asynchronous question and answer session where I'll be addressing some of the more common things that patients have been asking me about in clinic lately. The questions run the gamut from very concrete things like, how long does it take to get results with acupuncture? What is dry needling? And how do I get more protein into breakfast? To the more theoretical, we'll be getting into what Chinese herbs have to do with acupuncture, how we diagnose within the Chinese medical framework, a bit about pattern differentiation and why there is no one size fits all herbal solution, as well as the benefit to looking at patterns and not treating the disease itself, which can be illustrated by this recent bombshell of a study on depression. And we'll get into why following patterns may actually be more beneficial than following the latest scientific evidence. Much as I love a good study and practices rooted in science, looking through the lens that has endured for thousands of years is sometimes of greater benefit. And you'll see why. But first, I have a question for you. This is one that I asked the audience during a presentation I gave to the Chamber of Commerce here in Corvallis, Oregon, because the number one barrier by far to getting people connected to potentially life-changing acupuncture treatment for pain, arthritis, stress, chronic conditions that they think they just have to live with is that they are afraid of needles. And to me, this is beyond tragic. But at the same time, I totally get it. It's it's really understandable because most of us are familiar with hypodermic needles used for injections and blood draws. And while the word is the same, needle, they're really different tools than the little flexible wands that we use to communicate with the body's intelligence and bioelectricity during an acupuncture treatment. And it feels really different. So my question for you is how many needles and by this, I mean the average workhorse needle that I use in my acupuncture clinic. How many of those can fit inside the average hypodermic injection needle? I'll give you a second to think about it. Injection needles are typically 20 to 22 gauge, and I use a 38 gauge. The reason they're so much smaller is that I'm not taking out or putting anything into the body. 
I'm just making contact with the body's intelligence, with the bioelectricity that runs mainly in the fascia. And I might use a, a thicker gauge needle if I'm going for a trigger point and like a tight band and some muscles or something. But in any case, it's a very, very different tool. So think about it. Do you have your answer? Okay, I'll tell you. I won't make you wait till the end of the show. I'm not going to be cheesy like that. Okay, the correct answer is about 28 to 30 of my standard acupuncture needle could fit inside a hypodermic. Isn't that wild that we're using the same word to describe both of those things? And like, if you didn't know the difference, like, isn't it much easier to imagine acupuncture as a relaxing experience when you think about them as little tiny wands? Shout out to my friend and colleague, Alexa Gilmore, for this use of the term wands. In any case, it's a really different thing and we should be thinking about it differently. And it's kind of unfortunate that it's the same word to describe a very different process it will take to get relief. And like, why, if they just want to try acupuncture, why isn't it okay to just make one appointment? And the reason for that is this, is like you wouldn't, if the proper dosage of acupuncture is a handful of visits, because we heal at the speed of the body and acupuncture works by tapping into the body's intelligence. First of all, every case is different. So it's hard for me to say like in general terms, but if I were to generalize, even conditions that have been around for years, if it's like a musculoskeletal thing before someone signs up for a first visit, I want to encourage them to get on the books for a handful of visits, specifically two a week for three weeks. And the reason for that is that they could be about 50% better in that amount of time. And then at visit number five or six or so, I'll do a report of findings. I'll tell them like, okay, this is how far I feel like we've come. And here's what I think you're going to need in order to get all the way better. Or enough time for me to, to realize like, okay, this really isn't responding like I think it should and to refer out. But in general, it's like if you just go once for an acupuncture treatment, it's like going to like one fifth of an operation or taking like one dose of an antibiotic. It's like it's not going to actually do the thing you want it to do. And it could potentially, there are such things as compensation patterns, right? So if you've got back pain, for example, that's been going on for a really long time and you come in for acupuncture and what we do is we loosen things up. We release some some tension in places that have been holding you. Maybe there is like pain changes position, right? Maybe now you've been feeling it on your left, but now you're feeling it on the right. The body's been compensating, has been disabled. And so like it's it, there's a potential that things flare up. It's really helpful to come back in a few days later so that we don't get the body used to that new compensation pattern. It's like kicking down the guy wires of a tent and like the whole thing has to reconnoiter in response to the suggestion that we've made. And things usually actually better, you know, like people will often experience relief after their first visit or maybe they're sore for a minute or a day or so, but usually on day two or day three, depending on your immune system, you will notice that things are significantly different. Like like pain, if it's usually at say a six or a seven, might be down to like a three or a four. Maybe people notice that they're able to do things for longer periods of time without having pain. Maybe they're noticing that they don't have to take pain medication. Maybe they're noticing that it's a, that pain has gone from a really diffuse, like referring down their leg area to just being localized in one area. All of these things are changes that we see as progress, right? As we see as we've initiated a change to the body and we just need to keep that conversation with the body going. So it's really important to schedule a series. And like, I think it does nobody any good to come in for one visit and then to make your evaluation at that point, because it's just kind of not what it takes in order for things to respond. And, and again, you might feel great for a couple days. I've certainly had patients after one visit, they're pain-free and they do, you know, they, they kind of are at risk of overdoing because they've been waiting to feel good. And so they like go on that long bike ride or they do, they wash their car or something like that. And then it's like, oh no, you know, two steps forward, three steps back in that process because you're getting endorphins, 
you're getting neurotransmitters, you're getting anti-inflammatory effects, and all of that will enable you to do more very likely. And at the same time, it's like, you're not done. And so I just like warning people what to expect. It's like you've taken a giant anti-inflammatory. You might not be getting all your pain messages after acupuncture. Now that isn't to say you can't work out. It isn't to say that you can't do normal things, but I usually encourage people to take it down a notch to maybe an 80% day instead of a maxed out 110% day. So just like physical therapy or chiropractic, it's a process. And so even if something's been around for years, we can expect it to take a little while to to reverse that process and to start getting you feeling better. But generally speaking, if it's a pain issue, I recommend twice a week for at least three weeks. And then usually after that, it's like, as I said, do a report of findings. We figure out where we are. Maybe at that point, you can go down to once a week if time and money are still make progress. I had a patient the other day who like, I see her once every two weeks or so. And she's still able to progress on a painful condition that she's had for years. And it's amazing to me, but it's like, it's like, we're still making progress, but we're making it very slowly because that's what she can commit to doing. So I'll take it. You know, it's like there's this stuff. It's just for maximum benefit that momentum is your friend. Acupuncture visits can be really beneficial. So hopefully that's helpful. Is it like when you think about like, is acupuncture for me the process that the other branches of Chinese medicine, like herbs, lifestyle, and diet stuff is going to be a more important intervention than acupuncture. And so you can usually get away with like, I usually will suggest to people that you come in for still a handful of visits, but maybe once a week so that while or herbs and lifestyle and diet stuff is in the process of changing, you're still getting acupuncture supporting that process because really like all of the home care and the herbs are like the take home version of the medicine. And so it's like, we want to support you, but we also want to equip you to empower yourself and take charge of your own healing. So understanding that healing is a process, it's often not a linear one, right? You're not just doing your healing work in a vacuum, you're living your life at the same time. And it could be sometimes really beneficial to be doing other things like physical therapy or chiropractic or massage therapy, if that's indicated. But all of these things are going to be contributing to helping the body to heal. And it's a process. So giving it time to work before you evaluate it is really important. Also, acupuncture works great as a standalone therapy and giving it time to work, just like giving yourself time for a medication to ramp up its dosage in their body, or you know, you don't start taking vitamin D to correct a deficiency and expect to see a result the next day. It is a process and it can be really different depending on whether or not you have an underlying chronic condition, how long the thing's been going on, what you're doing in your daily life that might be preventing you from getting better. All of these things make it a really difficult question to answer, but it's It's one that we are able to usually guess at after we've seen somebody for a handful of visits. Which brings me to my next question, which is, what is dry needling? I had a patient who was curious about dry needling. And essentially, the the simplest answer is that dry needling is acupuncture. So basically, all dry needling is acupuncture in the sense that nothing is being inserted into the body or withdrawn from the body. But if you go on the Mayo Clinic website, right, it's described as the insertion of thin filiform needles, which is incidentally the exact definition of acupuncture. But the, the Mayo Clinic defines it as being performed by trained physical therapists certified in the procedure. Now, this is where I take issue with it because basically this is a clear example of physical therapists trying to take acupuncture from our scope of practice and use it under theirs, which can be really problematic if they're not very well trained. They can injure people. And I, I seems like the cases that make the news are, are pretty awful. And it, I, I feel like are giving acupuncture a bad name. Basically, dry needling, why someone would seek it out is because you're looking at the body through a Western lens. You're looking at things like trigger points, tight bands and muscle fibers that restrict range of motion or cause pain. And so when I'm doing kind of orthopedic style sports medicine acupuncture, I'm looking like one could argue that I'm doing dry needling. But the difference is that I have a 3,000 hour master's degree in Chinese medicine and not to mention 19 years of experience of doing this all day long. And it's not just like an adjunct to something that I'm doing as part of my practice. But it's different because like acupuncture is based on the kind of classical meridian theory rooted in 
Chinese medicine theory, while dry needling is rooted in sort of Western anatomy and evaluation of trigger points, pain patterns, functional and orthopedic testing kinds of things. So not all acupuncturists look through this lens. Some acupuncturists are classically trained and that's where they stay. But there's a whole lot of acupoints that happen to be trigger points, like a lot that overlap. But generally speaking, you're, I think, far better off, like you know, in some states that allow physical therapists and chiropractors and doctors to do quote unquote dry needling with very minimal training, like a weekend workshop or maybe a series of weekend workshops. I actually used to teach for just such a program because I felt like I just wanted to democratize acupuncture to everyone. And like, if someone already has a medical degree, do they really need to study acupuncture in depth in order to help people? But I really personally got turned off from it because of basically the lack of respect I felt like a lot of these professionals in other disciplines had for acupuncture and for the way it's traditionally done. Poorly done dry needling can be painful or worse, harmful. So if you're going to do dry needling, which can be an awesome thing for sports medicine, orthopedic style things, get it done by a licensed acupuncturist who specializes in sports medicine or orthopedic or XDOR, the system that I've studied and really uh, feel like is really helpful. So hopefully that's helpful is dry needling is, is essentially acupuncture, but be careful with who you choose to receive it from. Okay. Another question that I get from patients a lot is more in the, in the realm of lifestyle and diet. So I work with people on helping them, for example, reverse metabolic syndrome, reverse prediabetes or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, that kind of that problem that most Americans are headed for if unless we pretty much take matters into our own hands and, and opt out of the standard American diet. So I talk to people a lot about getting protein, fat, and fiber at every meal. And so one of my patients asked like, okay, I've got blood sugar concerns. I've got lunch and dinner figured out, but I want to know what to do for breakfast. What do you eat for breakfast? And how do you feel about protein shakes? I think this is a great question because yeah, like a lot of times like just eating more vegetables, having at least half your plate of vegetables is a great rule to, to go by. And then having the rest of your plate be divided up into a protein source and a complex carb source is, is a really easy rule to go by in terms of having a balanced meal and making sure that there is some fat involved in that. But for a lot of people, breakfast looks like cereal or toast, and they're not really sure what to do instead. So first off, I'll answer the last part. I am very anti-protein shake. I will admit that I have a whole foods bias. I believe that we should be eating what our ancestors ate, what our biology understands how to make use of. And so I, I do see a lot of functional medicine doctors recommending protein shakes and maybe like white labeling their own protein shakes so that they can make money. I don't think this is a great idea. I think that essentially protein shakes are a super processed food that our body goes, huh, what do I do with this? And I can tell you that I don't think I've ever seen anyone who regularly relies on protein shakes who does not have a tongue that's coated with that thick polymicrobial film that indicates that something is not being processed very well. If just fundamentally, it's an ultra-processed food that is mo most likely displacing real food in a person's diet. So uh, protein isolates are not found in nature. They're just not. Like we, we are meant to consume food. And I believe that there's wisdom in, but just like it with an herb, it's like when you extract the part that you think is going to do the therapeutic job, you're taking away the other chemical components that maybe balance it out a bit. Bottom line for me is that protein powder, no matter how free of additives and preservatives and whatever else sweeteners that it might have in it, that I personally don't see how you can get around that this is an ultra processed food. And I, I think that the idea of a quote unquote clean protein powder is frankly marketing and that we are better off eating whole foods because our bodies understand what to do with them. And yes, this is a bias. I will own that. So what should you have for breakfast if you're not going to load it up with an ultra-processed something that 
that the body doesn't quite understand? Well, I do have a few suggestions, which could range from simple things like eggs and greens, which you can make in under 10 minutes. You could throw some oatmeal and chia and chopped up nuts and fresh or dried fruit and some cinnamon into a bowl and have it cook itself. <laughs> or even rolled oats take less than 10 minutes on the stove with, uh, with a little water. And the nuts and seeds or even peanut butter or almond butter or something like that could protein it up for you. And that could be easy and quick. You could also do what I've been enjoying lately. This is a maybe unconventional, but I've been throwing beans and greens and spices and some kind of fat in a pot and calling it breakfast. So my process is I've been partial to spinach and arugula because those don't take very long to cook. I'll throw a bunch into a pot along with a, I'll open a can of beans, either black or cannellini is what I've been favoring these days and throw the beans right there in the pot with the greens. I'll throw in, if I'm wanting something that's more like a soup, I'll throw in some water or some stock if I have something like that around. And I'll use about a teaspoon of a spice mix. So right now I've been rocking a smoked paprika, chili pepper, black pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, oregano blend, which is sort of well, which I've been enjoying. It pairs really well with that kind of stuff. Maybe I'll throw in either some avocado or some sour cream or some tahini for fat. And if I've got like leftover quinoa from the night before or leftover rice or something, if I feel like I want some carbs involved, I'll throw that in too. But a lot of times I'll just do the beans and greens and fat and again, if it's if it's more on the soupy side, it's uh, then it's it's filling because of the liquid. And if it's more on a bowl side, like a taco bowl or a burrito bowl kind of a thing, then I could even throw some salsa on it or something, you know, that that makes it feel more like a meal that I'm eating with a fork. And so I've been really enjoying that, and it's really fast. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of easy proteiny breakfasts that you can make relatively quickly. Okay, here's where we get into the benefits of differential diagnosis and looking at the pattern rather than the label of a disease. Late July, there were these two stories that just were like jaw-droppingly, earth-shatteringly stunning to me. And I didn't have the bandwidth to totally do anything about it at the time. But the two things that I'm referring to is, first of all, there was a study pointing out that uh, that everything we know about Alzheimer's is likely due to fraud, due to uh, one of the leading papers that's the most cited was images were manipulated. And so all like billions of dollars in NIH funding has gone to, you know, the researchers going down completely the wrong rabbit hole studying amyloid plaques which may not have anything to do with Alzheimer's because of this, because the research was manipulated. So that was one thing that was just like, wow, I can't even believe that, like, no wonder there are not great treatments for Alzheimer's is because all of the super smart people studying this medicine have been led astray by somebody lying is what looks like is happening. So that was one thing that was like, whoa, I can't believe that that's going on. The second thing was that there was a, a paradigm shifting research study. It was called an umbrella study. So they're, they're looking not just at one study, but a whole bunch of meta studies that were done. And this, this was published in molecular psychiatry in, on July 20th that said that there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin levels. So this is huge, right? Like the dominant theory about what depression is about has to do with serotonin. And the most of the drugs that are the norm for helping people with depression are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? The SSRIs. So what I saw happen next on social media was that a lot of people got really defensive, usually citing that their own depression had improved due to SSRIs, and therefore there must be something wrong with this with this study. And and certainly this is this is the case where about half of people, according who take SSRIs, notice that it it helps their symptoms go down, especially people 
with the most severe symptoms. So my point in bringing up this study is not to debate the merits or demerits of the study, but because it's curious to explore what's going on here. I mean, obviously, some people are saying, well, hey, it worked for me. So what What do you mean? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean it doesn't work? Well, clearly there's a lot we don't know about the body. Serotonin may be part of the picture, but not the root cause. And there may be different causes of depression for different people. Some factors that we know that influence depression include someone's diet and what kind of gut flora they have riding along and that the gut brain axis. We can think about minerals like insufficient zinc or vitamin D or thyroid hormone or B6, all sorts of things that are important for mood stabilization. Someone's history of trauma, chronic stress, including systemic stressors like poverty and racism and needing to work three jobs might be, might be getting someone down. Chronic inflammation in the brain due to an underlying infection of a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or an environmental toxin like mercury, all sorts of things might be going on in terms of why an organism like a human being might want to withdraw and not enjoy the things that they used to enjoy and change their behavior to isolate and not be able to find joy. And in Chinese medicine, we have a phrase that is one disease, a thousand causes, and one cause, a thousand diseases. So in this case, if we're thinking about depression, that's one word that is describing a suite of symptoms, right, that people experience. And that may be stemming from different underlying factors for each person. Now, the really cool thing about Chinese medicine is that the first thing that we try to do is strip the labels off of a condition and just think about the differential diagnosis or what pattern is at play with a particular individual and how can we treat that root cause pattern in addition to the symptom that they're showing up with. So a person in Chinese medicine who is dealing with depression along with tight neck and shoulders and migraines and insomnia is going to actually get a different diagnosis, different points, and different herbs, and different self-care strategies than someone who shows up with depression but also has early periods and gas and bloating and heart palpitations, gets dizzy when they stand up, and is tired all the time. In this case, these are two different patterns of, of disharmony or two different presentations. In, in one, the first case, liver chi stagnation, and in the second case, more a spleen and heart deficiency pattern. We'd also look at the person's tongue and take their pulse to confirm this differential diagnosis or pattern of disharmony. And then we would treat that with whatever branches of the medicine the person is willing to work with and that makes sense. And of course, whatever herbs that we might be using are going to go after that that pattern and the, the different points that we're using are going to go after the pattern in addition to the symptom. So the kind of cool thing about Chinese medicine is that we're not thinking about what herbs treat serotonin, right? We're not, we're not thinking about like what herbs moderate serotonin deficiencies or what herbs help us deal with amyloid plaque. We're not thinking along those lines because we're not treating this one particular suspected mechanism of action for a particular condition. We're treating the human being in front of us and the set of symptoms that the pattern that's underlying their particular imbalance. And that's, that's, I think what struck me about the two studies together is because it's like in Chinese medicine, we certainly think about there's herbal and point prescriptions for dementia and for depression and for all sorts of things, but they are not one size fits all. They are individual, individually based, which is why it's very unlikely that if someone has a, a miracle experience with a particular herb, then they come in and they say, what do you think of ashwagandha or ginseng or turmeric? My answer is always, it depends. <laughs> are we talking about you or are we talking about someone else? Because it may be that that very same prescription or that single herb that worked so great for you might not be the same medicine for your partner or your mom or whoever. They need their very own differential diagnosis. Another cool thing about taking Chinese herbal medicine for a given pattern of disharmony is that you're likely going to see changes in multiple systems of the body at the same time. So we think about 
root and branch, if the root is the underlying disharmony and the branches are how that disharmony is showing up in terms of symptoms. So there's usually a lot of positive side effects to using Chinese herbs and very few negative side effects, if any, because we're treating both the root and the branch at the same time. We're going after the underlying pattern of disharmony and trying to change that kind of climate or ecosystem of the body at the same time as we are, as herbs in the formula might be aiming at whatever branches or specific symptoms that are causing them to seek treatment. Another reason that there's generally not a lot of negative side effects is because these herb formulas oftentimes go back hundreds, if not thousands of years, where they've figured out which herbs have properties of moderating the but potentially harsh side effects of some of the stronger herbs in the formula. And you're typically not taking too much of any one thing. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So instead of taking 12 different supplements, you're taking, you know, you're essentially 12 different herbs that are mixed into one formula that it then sends one message to the body. So the equivalent was giving someone cake mix instead of giving them a bag of sugar and a bag of flour and a bag of cocoa powder and everything else. So we make a differential diagnosis and we give very specific Chinese herbal medicine, acupuncture points, and also lifestyle and diet interventions that go along with that particular diagnosis. Getting back to depression for a bit. There are plenty of things that have been shown to help depression, among them acupuncture, Chinese herbal formulas that have very different mechanisms of action, but can be prescribed based on the pattern. Some like Xiaoyasan, one of our more commonly prescribed herbs for the liver chi stagnation pattern, has been shown in 26 randomized trials to be helpful for depression eating less sugar and alcohol and processed food and other foods that might be specifically inflammatory to a particular individual could be really important. We know that exercise and breathing and qigong can be really powerful in influencing someone's mood because they literally are changing the chemistry, changing which gases are at play in our system, circulating, causing the body's release of beta endorphins. And of course, working directly on the level of the mind or the consciousness with things like talk therapy or hypnotherapy or plant medicines like psilocybin or ketamine that are being researched could potentially be really helpful as well. Now, which important, how important each of those pieces are going to be, I think are going to depend on what is the underlying cause for a given individual. So someone who is in a spiritual depression, a a crossroads in life, maybe they've just ended a major relationship or they are disillusioned with the world and they are depressed because of things that are involving the spirit and the mind and outlook. Maybe that person is going to be better off talking with a therapist or looking at life through a different perspective with plant medicine, as opposed to someone whose depression is caused by a latent pathogenic factor like a fungus or a virus or chronic disease, or not having the right kind of gut flora on board and not being able to make happy chemicals in the body. So one disease, a thousand potential causes, and the need for differential diagnosis and smart strategy in order to be able to figure out what to do about it. Okay. So I think I'm, I've exhausted everything that I was planning on talking with you about today. If you have a question that you'd like me to answer on a future episode, please let me know. You can always reach out at brody at brodywelch.com. And if you know of anyone who could benefit from hearing any of the things that I've talked about today, please feel free to share the episode with them. My one last question for you is I'd like to invite you to consider what would make the most difference for you in your life as far as you feeling better right now and commit to the smallest step you can take in the direction of making that happen. I want you to take care of yourself because you matter. And when you are taking care of yourself, you are helping to change the culture, giving other people that living by example permission to take care of themselves as well. And we all need that. If you need some help, I'm happy to work with you in a coaching capacity, or if you are an Oregonian in a telemedicine or in my clinic capacity. Thanks for listening today. To check out the show notes, get on my email list or drop me a line, head to brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. 
I'd love to hear from you. If you learned something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.